Quantum computing feels like a young field, but some of us have been in the industry for a decade or longer. Fear of a quantum cryptographic apocalypse has launched a lot of careers and a lot of companies. Post-quantum, no relation, has been developing end-to-end -end solutions for quantum secure communications since 2009. And they recently participated in a year-long proof of concept with NATO. Find out more about practical solutions to prep for the cryptographic apocalypse in this episode of the Post-Quantum World. I'm your host, Konstantinos Kragianis. I lead quantum computing services at Prativity, where we're helping companies prepare for the benefits and threats of this exploding field. I hope you'll join each episode as we explore the technology and business impacts of this post-quantum era. Our guest today is the CEO from a company called Post Quantum. I, I realize that might be confusing because this is the post quantum world, but uh, it is different than this podcast. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Anderson Cheng. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Your company made some news recently. Um, there was a, a long running experiment uh, going on with the NATO Cybersecurity Center. Uh, so we're going to get into that. Um, but first, I, I'd love for you to just give me a little quick background on what it is the post quantum does. We founded the company back in 2009. So from a startup angle, we're not new, but if you have to do R&D in post-quantum cryptography, and that's what we focus on, you do have to spend your time doing it. So we spent our early years doing a lot of that, uh, and then we did some submissions to the NIST and ITF and so on, which have achieved pretty good results. And in the meantime, we have developed a suite of uh, products uh, in identity, in in uh, other blockchain-related stuff, uh, but always with a quantum-safe foundation in mind. Yeah, that's great, because a lot of times we talk about these abstract concepts and, oh, the threat to cryptography, but um, companies like yours are actually making products available now that you can actually start thinking about how you're going to be protected tomorrow. Um, so. The one that caught my eye is obviously the, the hybrid VPN. Uh, did you want to talk a little bit about that? You, you guys have the only uh, finalist in, in the code base space and the NIST finalist, right? Uh, then I would just rewind a little bit to, just to go back to my background because I trained as a computer auditor more than 30 years ago. So I have always uh, looked at cybersecurity with an end to end. Uh, thinking in mind, because uh, over the years we have seen a lot of solutions and they tend to be pretty much isolated. And uh, you can have the best firewall, best intrusion detection, best whatever. But do they really talk to each other? Do they actually link up to each other? So I spent a long time trying to think about what would, you, what would be the perfect ecosystem. And then my co-founders and I were thinking about, well, actually, before we can even do that, we have to think about the public key cryptography that we use today, um, namely our RSA or elliptic curve, they're not quantum safe. So when a quantum computer comes into existence, then we can just forget about it because everything will, will be broken. So it was on that basis that we started uh, doing a lot of heavy R&D on, 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 on how to make things work. Uh, because public key cryptography is used in everything, uh, whether it's on this video call that I'm having with you or on a wireless uh, chat I, I have on my iPhone, uh, we use it. Um, now, if you want to come up with the best solution, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of your audience are already aware that uh, NIST uh, has, had, has been running this competition for the next generation uh, PQC standards. So we submitted our proposal back in 2017. Uh, we were one of 82 submissions. Uh, and now, hopefully, NIS is going to announce their final standards any day now in April. Uh, there are three finalists left in Lattice and one left in Codebase. And that's where we focus on. So uh, that's kind of the background on our uh, thinking uh, behind uh, public key cryptography. And, and I think um, you also mentioned um, uh, in terms of practicality, uh, there is a difference uh, between us and our peers or competitors because a lot of uh, our peers, they are academics, they focus on optimizing the mathematics. But we are all ex-engineers. We actually look at the real-life problem and to see whether we can come up with a solution for it for real-time and real-life use rather than uh, 
uh, some mathematics uh, which can have all the glory, but but whether you can put it into practical use, that's another matter. So that's the NIST competition. Uh, we also submitted a, a hybrid PQ VPN proposal to IETF, uh, which actually formed the foundation of the next generation standard in secure connectivity. And on that one, it's actually quite interesting because um, uh, I can tell you uh, from experience, uh, it's been a bit of a struggle for us. That's probably an understatement because I was always the only person shouting from the rooftop back in 2009 and 10 and so on, saying, look, quantum is coming. That really will be the end. People were all laughing at us, saying, oh, let's worry about it post-quantum. So I actually uh, coined uh, a number of uh, uh, terms which are now widely used by, by the industry because even if they're skeptics thinking it might be 10, 20 years away, but how about what we call the harvest now and decrypt later attacks? Because now is in abundant evidence that certain adversaries are actually diverting, diverting the internet traffic to certain European, Eastern European countries or even Russia for two, three hours at a time, and then they were back to normal. So we have to do something about that. Now, a little bit on the on the VPN, um, obviously, uh, our recent conclusion uh, on that experiment with, with NATO uh, has attracted some attention. The reason why it came about was uh, after our submission to IETF, uh, it caught the eye of certain departments, and we did the crypto libraries for that, and then it caught the eye of NATO. Because we have known NATO uh, for a number of years now, and uh, we have been very friendly. Uh, we collaborate on uh, uh, on several projects. And last year, they approached us like saying, oh, um, this hybrid PQ VPN, we have to uh, try something out. Do you have something available? We differ from our peers because most of them focus on putting algos on chips or into HSM boxes, but we focus on enterprise software solutions. So we just thought, okay, uh, if just imagine if I go to a CISO or, or a bank CIO and say, look, uh, NIS has now come up with this new standard, uh, whether it's lattice or code base, doesn't matter. If I'm asking you to throw your RSA away today and adopt a new standard, most likely no enterprises would actually allow that to happen. But if I tell you, what if I give you a hybridized solution, belt and braces, I give you the elliptic curve in a tunnel, I wrap it around with a PQ adapter, then I can bring in the various NIST candidates. It doesn't need to be the final standard, it can be a, a number of those. So when we start to do the handshaking, uh, we can actually detect if we're both still using RSA, yeah, we downgrade that to our current uh, uh, primitive. But say if I have upgraded mine and you have upgraded yours to something else, then we can kind of look and see what where the common grounds are, and then we do the connection that way. So it gives people the flexibility on the migration. Because quantum migration will take many years, uh, and it carries, it brings... Uh, a different kind of characteristics is not Y2K, because Y2Q is entirely different. So let me expand on that one. I was actually on JP Morgan's Y2K migration committee. Thinking back, it was not too onerous a job because we had a, a definite deadline, but a known impact. So no one really knew what's going to happen. But the actual project was relatively onerous, but simple. Because you, all you had to do was to go through every single module to see whether there was a date field which would reset itself to 1st of January 1970. And then you mm -hmm. just, just correct it. And then you move on to the next and the next. Y2Q is actually the other way around. You don't know when it's coming. But when it comes, the impact is going to be 100%. And you cannot just look at all these in isolation because public key cryptography is all about handshaking. So if I'm now trying to connect between A and B, I may have worked something else out, which is perfect. But when you now come to into the enterprise, now you start handshaking between B and C, C and D and so on. If you're not careful at the beginning, you may have an impact or a different set of parameters which will affect your subsequent 
uh, performance. So that's the kind of beauty of it. I've been a fan of hybrid approaches for a while because, um, like you said, it, you agree on something and then you send the information. So it doesn't break anything, but in mm -hmm. certain circumstances, it can provide enhanced security. And if one day um, a quantum computer tries to attack that protocol, hopefully the wrapper of, in this case, I guess, NTS Chem, right, would um, actually uh, provide uh, that extra layer of security. But it hasn't broken anything. The systems still work. This is kind of similar. Amazon's doing something not too dissimilar in AWS, right? They have their um, hybrid approach where you can use Kyber, mm -hmm. uh, Bike Psych, um, and, and do kind of that hybrid handshake. Um, so rolling your own cryptography is hard. I mean, that, that's like sort mm -hmm. of a security cliche, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd love if you could take me behind the scenes of what kind of testing you did to make sure your solution is airtight, and then also what NATO might have put you through in this whole year-long okay. experiment? Because it was from like last okay. March, well, I believe, right? Well, then I have to rewind uh, the timeline way beyond, uh, way before last year, because we we were doing our own R&D back in 2013, 2014 at the time, when the whole world would not believe us. So what we did was, okay, we have to put it on something. So we actually created a secure WhatsApp equivalent. And then we put our... Uh, error correcting code based approach. What we at the time we called it uh, NTS, never the same, uh, which has now merged with uh, the submission led by Danny Bernstein, uh, this top cryptographer in the world. Uh, so the uh, Classy McLeese is now the the finalist. So we put it in uh, uh, into our secure messaging app uh, that, that was back in 2014, and we were able to prove it would work smoothly day in day out. And one thing people probably do not realize, uh, they all think is as simple as swapping out RSA and swapping in something else. And I can tell you, definitely not, because through that experience, we learned uh, quite a bit of what we call secondary characteristics uh, in PQC, because they all behave slightly differently depending on the primitive you, you use. So we, uh, we were able to face uh, a number of uh, roadblocks in 2014, and that's how we had built up our expertise in optimizing it. At the time, it was just for code base, and then through the hybridization thinking, we were thinking more and more how we could mix and match together. So our focus had been very much on that type of, um, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it cannot fail, because uh, in the prior venture, we were involved in uh, cannot fail projects. Uh, but for this kind of enterprise solutions, we were able to do quite a lot of um, testing on that uh, based on different sort of uh, uh, connectivity, uh, whether it's wireless, whether it's online through the link or, or whatever. So we did quite a lot of that. And then uh, during the um, hybrid PQ VPN project with NATO, uh, we provided what we thought was the optimized solution. And then we... we uh, gave them the crypto libraries, and then they were able to test it over a number of locations. And they were uh, mixing and matching different types of uh, uh, PQC primitives. And a report was written on it, and their conclusion was um, was that it's uh, a PQC would be practical for real-world implementations. And we presented the findings at one of their conferences last uh, November, and also did one uh, to their next conference uh, last week. Um, so, um, so they concluded uh, the hybridized approach would work uh, and it can be interoperable because NATO is a really interesting use case, uh, unlike anyone else, because it's got 30 member states and it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to work out all 30 member states will have different um, equipment using different operating systems. So. Uh, some of them may take a long time to upgrade, and I may have upgraded mine. So we always have to work on the lowest denominators. So, uh, so NATO did a number of testing on that. Uh, unfortunately, some of those I, I actually cannot share with the uh, with the audience, uh, but they they were happy enough with with the output, uh, and they have now come up with some next steps as well on further optimization on and also on how to put it into a field trial. Um, for example, uh, on uh, uh, wireless and satellite comms, uh, and also on connected soldiers in theater, 
and and also on IoT sensors because IoT is is also another uh, I wouldn't say strange, but is is something that we have to uh, consider seriously as well. Depending on whether your sensors have enough processing power and battery power, so sometimes you do not have enough. Uh, uh, so microprocessing capability there. So you have to drop yourself down to down to the lowest denominator uh, for that to work. So so there, there's this kind of considerations one has to go through. Uh, have there been any adversarial approaches taken either in the NATO experimentation or in what you do? So I, I'm assuming they did a lot of interoperability testing, torture testing, no. bandwidth, you know, all, all sorts of like, um, consider, like you said, with IoT. Um, we know in the past you couldn't even upgrade passwords on some of them. They were hard coded. So imagine trying to change cryptography. But were there any um, attempts at things like side channel attacks or were there any like, you know, sort yeah, of yeah. darker projects like that that were done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a number of those CCA and so on. Uh, I've actually got a report. Um, I can ask for permission. I mean, it's not a, a classified report. I can ask for permission. And, and if they're happy, I can, I can share that with you. Uh, so they, they did consider a number of those normal crypto stress testings or, as you said, advers mm -hmm. as adversarial type attacks. That would be interesting to see because because we all know that part of the NIST process has to include how secure is the solution, right? Like it, it can't just yep. be a theory. <laughs> they're, they're also looking for certain layers. Are you are you aware of any of, of what goes on there right now in, in this finalist round? Do they do they give you feedback on what they're doing with these finalists? Like like how serious it gets from here? I don't know whether you are on the NIST PQC forum uh, is actually quite a vibrant forum when i say vibrant it can be a little bit colorful in terms of people ex especially you have all the top cryptographers all trying to have a go at each other so mm -hmm. sometimes when you when you read uh, their comments uh, you you do learn quite a lot from 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 that because some of them will specialize in just one area of the attack uh, and then people will say whether this particular candidate is good enough for that or not so so uh, that that provides quite a bit of insight uh, in, into the whole thing. NIST itself, as an organization, uh, they have not been very kind of like participative in the in the forum discussions because that's more for the uh, for the world's cryptographers and and relevant people to kind of critique on each other's uh, submissions. Um, and NIST will just be more or less be observing. Uh, on some of that, from time to time, when certain debates get a little bit too heated, then they jump into mediate. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, for the last 10 years or so, whenever I would uh, talk about this topic, there would always be some cryptographic argument after. <laughs> there would always be yeah, people disagreeing yeah. on dates yeah. and approaches. Yeah, that's correct. But, but, but one thing I, I would like to highlight is, um, and it's a sacrifice we, we had to make as well, because there are certain... Uh, inventors who come up with proprietary uh, crypto algorithms or even patented ones. We did patent hours as well, but we had to open up, we had to sign off, uh, sign away the rights uh, as part of the competition because otherwise you just will not get the crypto communities to scrutinize it. Um, and then you, you would think like, so should I just keep everything proprietary and secret and so on? But if the whole world doesn't adopt it, what is the point? So we decided to open it up and then to participate. With the projects you're working on, um, there's there's also an important thought around levels of um, the like long shelf life involved in data, right? So so for an approach like this, you probably wouldn't even try and convince a company to worry about this for just just any old information, right? Do, do you do any kind of work with customers to help strategize like what the long shelf life data is, like finding out what should go over a, a track like this, over, over a wrapper like this? Uh, that's a very good question because it depends on whom you speak to uh, and and where, and the nature of the data, whether you have to keep it for a long time. Uh, because mm -hmm. a, a lot of people have been saying, oh, yeah, well, for government grade data, you have to keep it for at least 25, 30 years or even more, depending on the country. 
But you have other data which you should start safeguarding even today, uh, like IP heavy industries, pharmaceuticals, battery research, and all these, uh, which they create a lot of the new thinking. And you don't want people to do half is now and decrypt later and suck out your stuff now and, and, and knowing they can open it up in a few years' time. Um, how about ID, uh, our own healthcare data? Um, biometrics mm -hmm. we have to keep safe forever until until I drop maybe even longer and uh, and I think increasingly in the financial services world people have, have also started thinking well in terms of trading data it can be like in the public domain in in a few weeks or a few months time but how about your asset allocation decisions because take BlackRock for example the largest asset manager in the world uh, I wouldn't be surprised if most of the sovereign wealth funds are their customers. So if one day uh, certain countries, like for example in the Middle East, if all the neighbors find out that uh, the asset manager is actually giving different biases or different asset allocation ideas or different fee structure to your neighbors, I'm sure people will not be very happy. So that kind of information you have to keep secret for a very long time. Yeah, there's there's reputational th concerns too. I'd imagine, yeah. <laughs> like like you just pointed yeah. out, um, how this data moves. My my favorite example is just to tell people, you know, if you have the secret formula Coca Cola, you probably want to be post quantum already. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be sending yeah. that around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that brings um, to an interesting joke that I tell people, but it's not a joke uh, because I, I was invited to a trading technology conference. And after my speaking slot, I went back to my area and there was uh, a senior, uh, well, there was CTO of a stock exchange. There was a, a senior partner of a regulator. And then there was another head of procurement, a, a large uh, investment bank. They were saying, oh, so how do you protect it? And I said, to be honest, uh, even today, I insist on all my bank statements to be on paper. Uh, because if there's a quantum attack or, or a huge hack when everything's gone online or it takes a long time for you to recover it back up, at least I will be at the front of the queue with some paper statements. You, don't, you want to guess what the response was from those three, four guys? And they said, well, we have a confession to make. We are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So these guys are, are keeping stuff on paper as well. And is the VPN approach the only practical solution you're looking at right now? Um, or are you trying to um, implement this hybrid in something else? Not necessarily, because if you think about it, um, I have lost count on all the jargons that people have come up with in the last 20 years. There's always something new every month. But at the, at the end of the day, if you look at your, your uh, computing process, uh, ruthlessly it's nothing more than input processing output with secure transmission in between so if you work on that principle then you can start thinking about how to create your next generation future proof ecosystem so uh, the vpn will provide you with a secure tunnel for the transmission at the end of the day is that sufficient the answer is probably not because if you've got the wrong person who come in then you can forget about the rest. So this is why your identity is normally your most important thing before you start going into your, your, your enterprise flow. So that kind of ID solutions, you have to think about how to make them quantum ready today and to become quantum safe later. So if you can imagine, you can have the most solid pipe in the world and people will start attacking the joints and then you start protecting joints people will start contaminating the water going into the pipe. So unless you have this end-to-end -end thinking, it's not going to work. So now if you've got your ID kind of quantum ready with a secure tunnel going into enterprise, then you start thinking about your messaging solution, your collaboration tools, your others. Then you can start upgrading them one by one. Because the quantum migration will not happen overnight. Uh, I was talking to a, a very top cryptographer um, a few months ago, he thought it would actually take 10 years to do. So this is why a lot of the consulting firms have been re-gearing and retraining their uh, consultants now to become quantum migration consultants, because there are already frameworks available 
from SC, from ERISA, from ANISA, from, from some of the other bodies. Uh, so you can actually follow that kind of framework to start doing your infantry audit and to see which module is using what kind of PQC and then you can, uh, sorry, uh, the current public key cryptography and then you can see which is the best PQC, uh, suitable PQC for that. Yeah, and, and you could see this approach being used everywhere that you're not even seeing regularly. Like, for example, um, web services, right? Yeah, whatever mm -hmm. information is being sent on the back end over an API, uh, that's pretty juicy. You know, that XML is usually a pretty juicy target. Um, there's a lot of like critical data being sent in that way. Um, mm -hmm. So can you quickly have tunnels there and, and all other places in the enterprise? It, it's kind of funny with this remote approach we're all doing to work right now still, or hybrid at least. Um, in some ways, if they were to implement something like your VPN, that organization would probably be more quantum, post quantum secure than any other because everything is from home quantum secure to something rather than like inside this building where no one even knows what's happening. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And and let me just throw something into the into the pot because uh, okay, VPN will give you a very secure tunnel, but now the industry trend is to say, oh, maybe we should do SASE or ZTNA and all these and. It's more like ID related, then surely you must be thinking about how to make your ID module quantum ready as well, because otherwise it's not going to work long term. So so it's it's really horses for courses and see whether you can sort of link them together depending on, on the on the customer requirements. Okay. And I guess one potentially uncomfortable question. What if uh, what if NIST says uh, no, we don't want NTS cam. <laughs> what if they decided the last minute for some technical reason that we can't foresee? You know, uh, to be honest, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore because we have built our own reputation in the crypto mm -hmm. community and in the defense community and so on. So this is why I have been. I actually, I, I believe I actually coined the, the 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 phrase hybridization back in 2015 because because um, uh, NTS. Or classic MacLeese is based on the MacLeese crypto system. I'm sure you know it's extremely powerful, extremely secure. Uh, it was invented more than 40 years ago, and people have all concluded it's MP hard because no one can crack it. At the same time, it does come with its um, uh, sort of like longer key size and so on. So it may not be usable in every single use case, but our expertise and know-how through the past few years. It's no longer built on just one one trick. It's like, okay, if it's lattice, what kind of characteristics are there? Can we then use the, the different lattice candidates and so on? So in fact, the um, the NATO VPN uh, test, we did not even put in our own classic McLeese because we knew uh, it would be much better and faster and more efficient to use let. Uh, uh, so a, a mix of uh, lattice and multivariate and isogeny mm -hmm. instead. So it's that kind of um, yeah, it's that that kind of thinking that we have. Uh, and but if if people like the German government, they have already said um, even even before the NIST uh, standardization, they are, they have already said classic McLeese is is good enough for for their purpose. And they have already asked their agencies and enterprises like if you have a uh, a relevant use case for that, you don't have to wait for this anymore. So, for example, in secure messaging, classic McLeese is really, really superior. So, so why, why, why would you want to use use uh, others? So it depends on on the use case and the uh, and the customer requirements, really. And then at that point, on your team continuing to poke at it and torture test it over time and be aware of anything that develops, really, uh, with with uh, your approach. That's correct. Yeah. So. Um, because now, uh, having having waited for all the years, uh, I, I have to. I, I'll be honest with you. There were several occasions that we were thinking whether we were way ahead of the time, whether people really appreciated or even wanted us. Should we just forget about it and just retire? Uh, but then we decided to persist on it, and now uh, I think everyone is talking about PQC. The market is definitely here. Uh, the timing is here. So now, uh, because a lot of people have been procrastinating uh, the need to do anything uh, until until NIST makes its announcement. So uh, so I hope uh, this 
standardization announcement that they're going to make in April uh, is going to be the beginning of uh, of some kind some form of migration. I believe the first pot of gold will be made by all the consulting firms, um, uh, and they they are the ones who will be able to start preaching to their clients and say, look, you have to think about it if you're going to be, because everyone is now migrating to the uh, to the cloud. Uh, and if people are doing vendor selection today, then why why don't you have a look at uh, quantum safe or quantum ready solutions? Um, I'm based in the, in the UK, uh, uh, but I know Joe Biden has got this 30 year infrastructure renewal plan. Um, I, I have lost count whether he's committed six or seven trillion dollars uh, by now, but I know uh, one of the questions in their RFIs or RFQs is like, what are you doing about quantum? Because you can imagine uh, if people are going to renew all the highways, all the railways, all the power grids and waterworks and so on, uh, a quantum attack is very likely uh, in, the, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So if they're doing it now, why don't they future-proof it? Terrific point. And uh, we currently, uh, in my company, we, we help customers figure out how agile they are, cryptography, you know, what, what needs to go, what, what, um, what is higher priority. So if we were to find some serious flaws and, and a company wanted to experiment with post-quantum cryptography, they would be able today uh, to try and introduce something like your hybrid VPN, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I, I think it's, um, it would be a very good start so that people can start uh, sort of trying to not fully integrate into their current infrastructure, but they can start, start trying out and understanding more of the uh, unusual characteristics. Then they know, ah, okay, well, this if I don't do, do, do it properly here, uh, I can actually create a, a buffer overflow. Or, so this is why I mm -hmm. have to do something else and so on. Uh, but it's, it's actually, um, we went, we, we actually went through a, quite a lot of um, uh, learning uh, back in 2014 because uh, maybe I, let me just give you a bit of background about our prior venture. It, it was a company called TRL. It's a company you probably would not have heard of before, but in the in the defense and in, in the intelligence world is as well known as Chanel because most people at GCHQ would would know because they would use the, the solutions. Um, it used to be top secret, but but the uh, acquirer L3 was very happy to tell the world that uh, that was the we were the only top secret grade hardware crypto supplier to the British government and the NATO allies. So it's. It's difficult for me to say. Um, it's you. You have to start playing with those hardware or software for you to get the feel, because no one understands a single enterprise's own infrastructure and their parameters and their their bottlenecks. And it's only through that kind of experimentation or or inventory audit that you can start getting a feel on what you have to optimize for your own for your own uh, 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 company or, or agency. Um, and, and because no one, no one in the world can, can do it for everyone, for everything. So we all have to start from somewhere. So I believe the VPN is a good, is a good starting point. Yeah, with everything at Quantum, I'm finding customers want to do a small proof of concept. They want to you know, pick one area, focus on it, see how it works, get their feet wet. So um, as far as the post-quantum cryptography side, I, I think it would be good to roll out something very focused and targeted like that. Yeah, so yeah, I'm definitely yeah. going to share information in the show notes. And then in, in parallel, um, a lot of people are now talking about Web3. Uh, Web3 is also blockchain-based economy, I'm sure you know. Yep. Web3 is built on elliptic curve, which is not PQ. So in that community, uh, some people are arguing like, oh, hashing is PQ. Of course, hashing is PQ, but I'm talking about the other stuff, about the, about the signing, about the, uh, uh, when you have a quantum machine, it's not just about cracking it, it's about whether they can actually be faster in uh, doing the 51% attacks or in, in sort of like disturbing your kind of block creation and writing and confirmation. So even if, some diehards think, oh, that blockchain is still, is still PQ. How about the underlying infrastructure? 
How about the crypto wallet we use today? How about now I have to sign the, the, the coin to you? And how about my key recovery and the transmission and all the way to the exchange? All of that, a quantum machine can start fiddling and altering your balance mm-hmm. uh, with, uh, on the wallet and, and at the exchange, even as simple as reporting. So that's the, all of that will need to uh, have a complete rethink. Um, so, so Web3, um, the one difference I see is if people want to go for DeFi, um, that's very good, very efficient. But at the same time, if, there's, if something goes wrong, you don't have any recourse. You don't have a regulator or a central bank to say, look, uh, there's a hack. Uh, uh, at the bank, but central bank, you have to give me get, uh, because I know in the U.S. Um, the Federal Reserve have has to guarantee a two hundred fifty thousand dollar compensation if the hack was carried out at the bank level and it's not your fault. But in Web three, no one's going to give you money back. <laughs> yeah. So these are also policy considerations as well. So. I was going to ask about this. Are you? going to be touching anything in blockchain? Are you, are you going to be trying to come up with some partial solution at least? Yes, yes. I uh, and Let me tell you uh, another joke um, because I was invited to a blockchain conference um, about five years ago uh, when it was my turn to speak. I said, blockchain has no security. Blockchain only has immutability to prove what has been recorded there. And I was almost thrown out of the conference in front of 250 people attendees because the organizer said, look, hang on, I invited you to talk about how good blockchain is rather than problems. Well, I said, yeah, but immutability is different from security. But now in the past few years, a lot of people have now said, okay, we need to put security layers on top and so on. So we can address that in several directions. Um, I think in the community, people are now starting to think like for all the layer one protocols today, none of them are PQ. So there is a need to have a a quantum safe layer one uh, protocol. And now all the hacks that we're seeing today, uh, they are not necessarily attacks on the layer one, but it's all the people like on layer two or trying to build bridges to be interoperable. That's when you start having problems. So that is an area that we have to think about as well. Uh, I have also coined uh, another uh, phrase for this kind of uh, work. Uh, I actually call it, I, I, I'm not calling it DeFi, because I, I think we're probably still two, three years away from being able to have really good DeFi uh, solutions. I actually call what we have today, Hi-Fi. It's not a music system, but it's hybridized finance. Because if you imagine, uh, a lot of the criticism in the Web3 world is Web2 is really bloated, very bureaucratic, very slow moving, blah, 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 which is true. But at the same time, we have been very much a Web2 company um, in, in banking, in defense, and whatever. We have actually spent decades perfecting certain solutions, whether you call it ID or risk management platform or whatever. Why don't we be objective? Ignore the bureaucracy, but grab the best modules and products and solutions from the Web2 world and use it for Web3. Because the Web3's advantage is people can experiment and go live very, very quickly in no time. So why do we have to reinvent the wheel? Why don't we just grab the best and try to translate that for for, uh, Web3? And we are, in fact, doing some of those um, translation right now uh, to see what we can do in order to pluck some of those gaps because people used to argue with, with me and dismiss my thinking uh, but I don't think they're arguing anymore because every week you see a new hack and people have become numb whether you're losing 100 million or 625 million <laughs> or whatever so something needs to be done about it because right now a lot of the remedies there are actually compensations from the providers and one day those providers will run out of money to compensate the 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 users who've been hacked so i believe you you do need to have a new way of thinking about it and i think hi-fi is the way forward
Yeah, I, I'm probably going to want to have you back on in the future to talk just about that um, as you come up with some practical approach. Because I, I think right now blockchain needs a lot of help. Um, That's correct. There's there's very few blockchains that have any kind of post quantum cryptography. Um, we had we had one on. Yeah, we had the quantum resistant ledger on. We're going to have them on again with. Um, with this other lab that's working on a solution. So yeah. I do want to talk more about this in the future. Yeah, because I mean, if sometimes it's not just through the sheer quantum cracking capability, sometimes it's got to do with the protocol itself, because uh, if even if you have a, just a split second that the public key is revealed, uh, if a quantum machine is faster than what you are capable of processing, then they, they already have that tiny microsecond advantage and then they can they can do do something about it. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, so some of the protocols will, will will actually need quite a bit of uh, rethinking. But I know a lot of the hacks today they are actually happening at the cross chain type connectivity, and that's another uh, another. I have to say uh, the hackers today are really clever. I actually admire uh, their their <laughs> their ability. Uh, and and um, it, it's a difficult battle, but but I think this is that's where a lot of the issues will will arise, and uh, we we need to think about whether we can also come up with PQ solutions for that. Agreed. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your breadth of knowledge. Um, like I said, yeah, definitely going to want to have you back when when you're delving more into the blockchain world. Yeah, we're we're actually working on uh, on a module which we can help the Web3 world, as well as the Web2 world. And I believe that will reside very healthily and very correctly in uh, in the hi-fi, i.e. in between, that you can do both. Because, <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of uh, new stuff that we can learn from the, from the DeFi world. And then we already know there are some very good modules. If you ignore the bureaucracy, management, so on, some of those Web2 modules you can actually apply immediately. So that's H Y F I, right? H Y F I, yes. F -I. Please, yep. so. please broadcast it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that'll be our yeah. next topic for sure um, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you for having me. Now it's time for Coherence, the quantum executive summary, where I take a moment to highlight some of the business impacts we discussed today in case things got too nerdy at times. Let's recap. PostQuantum has been thinking about end-to-end -end post quantum cryptography solutions since 2009. They've been taking the coming crypto apocalypse very seriously. In 2017, they submitted NTS Chem Cypher to NIST's hunt for post quantum cryptography candidates. It has since merged into Classic McAleese and is a third round finalist. Post Quantum's VPN solution wraps traditionally encrypted data like elliptic curve in a PQC wrapper. This is a hybrid approach. If traditional encryption falls to a quantum computer of sufficient power, the PQC layer hopefully won't. They have a system that is similar to browser handshakes in that it can determine which ciphers are present and usable by both parties. NTS Chem was first used in a secure messaging app in 2013. The company has learned a lot in developing and testing it since then. In 2021, they began work on a NATO proof of concept for the National Cyber Security Center, or NCSC. This POC was designed to test communication flows that could maintain security against the quantum threat. Remember Y2K? This is fighting against Y2Q and is in many ways a more prevalent problem. The NCSC POC involved stress testing against the hybrid post-quantum VPN for almost a year. This contained a different hybrid approach than the original NTS Chem one. Solutions like this VPN are already important because certain information has a long shelf life. Credit card numbers are not eternal, but health information is, for example. PostQuantum is also concerned with quantum-ready identity management in keeping with their true end-to-end -end approach. The threat to blockchain has been discussed on this show before. PostQuantum is already giving thought to securing DeFi and Web3. Their proposed approach may involve something called HiFi, that's H-Y-F-I, or hybridized finance. Can some traditional modules from the Web2 world aid Web3 security? It will be interesting to see what the team comes up with. That does it for this episode. Thanks to Anderson Chang for joining to discuss PQC and post-quantum. And thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, 
Please subscribe to Prativity's The Post Quantum World and maybe leave a review to help others find us. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Constant Hacker. That's Constant with a K, Hacker. You'll find links there to what we're doing in quantum computing services at Prativity. You can also DM me questions or suggestions for what you'd like to hear on the show. For more information on our quantum services, check out Prativity.com or follow Prativity Tech on Twitter and LinkedIn. Until next time, be kind and stay quantum curious. <laughs>